You're listening to Cosmic Tonic. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, let me say that again. <clears throat> <laughs> Cosmic Tonic. Hello. Thanks for tuning in to the Cosmic Tonic podcast. We are so pleased to announce Audrey is the winner of October's 60 minute reading giveaway with the three of us. Check your email for scheduling. There is only one Audrey who entered. We'll leave last names out of the announcements to protect privacy. If you've already signed up, you will automatically be added to each raffle until the end of December. If you'd like to sign up, please go to the top menu bar of our homepage at cosmictonic.com. We'll reach out to you end of November to let you know if you won. As mentioned on our previous podcast, Cosmic Tonic is collaborating with Constellation Coffee Company on an astrological tea line. Libra Tea is ready for purchase and Scorpio Tea is coming this week at constellationcoffeeco.com forward slash Cosmic Tonic. We're working hard to get all the signs done and available for purchase on various sites, but for the meantime, please purchase at constellationcoffeeco.com forward slash cosmic tonic. In this episode, we speak with Steve Campman about dreams and astrology. If you like what we do, please leave us a five-star rating, write a review, or share the podcast with your friends. We appreciate it. And there's a couple different ways you can listen to us. One way is on your favorite podcast app or by subscribing to us on YouTube. As you know, we are committed to bringing you the best content related to astrology and the occult. We are fully funded by viewer support. So please donate to our podcast by visiting the link at the bottom of our homepage at cosmictonic.com. For those of you who've donated, thank you so much. It really helps us keep this podcast going. And as always, thanks again for being here and enjoy the show. Okay, here we go. <laughs> but I think Carl Young's a great launching off pad and we can do oh, a bit of an introduction, okay. but go for it. You want me to go go first? Okay, I'll, I'll tell it briefly, but basically like everybody um, who likes Carl Young, I'd read his, his autobiography, I think it's called Memories, Dreams and Reflections. And in there, there's a picture of the towers that he built on Lake Zurich to represent the kind of self that he'd been inspired by a trip to Africa where he noticed the circular structures of the homes and he liked the idea of doing that. So he found a local uh, kind of handyman near him and he went proceeded to build his self, you know, his self. And so I've always wanted to see it from that moment when I was in my twenties and about, oh, I don't know, maybe nine years ago, Judith and I were in Switzerland and we decided one day waking up in Zurich, let's go find the tower house. And so we got on a train, went down there, got out of the train, asked the cab driver, where's Carl Jung's tower house? And of course he had no idea who Carl Jung was. So he got on the dispatcher and found out Carl Jung was this, and he eventually got us to the house. And there was a car parked in the driveway, and I knew someone was there, and I was bummed out. So I said to Judith, what the hell? We've come this far. Let's go. So a woman came out, didn't speak English much, but she uh, said, let me speak to my husband. He came out, barrel-chested guy. Because the thing about the young house, they didn't have electricity. They didn't, everything was pumped water, grilling outside. It was all to get you to the core, more to your kind of basic animal self. And uh, so anyway, we came in and he introduced himself as the great grandson of Carl Jung. And this was his wife. And then he proceeded to introduce me to his 16 year old, beautiful Swiss daughter. And I immediately thought my son, Mikey has to marry her so I can be in the Carl Jung family. That's all I could think about. I, I swear to God, I kept thinking, I've got to get to a phone. So are they <laughs> married now? <laughs> oh, I'm so disappointed they're not. 
<laughs> I, I keep telling my wife when she's ready to put me in an institution, just please do it in Switzerland. I just want to go to Switzerland. I'm happy in Switzerland, Carl Young, Hermann Hesse from there. It's beautiful, things are on time, it's more civilized. <laughs> I'd kill to be in, in an institution there. And you know, there I'd be in an institution if I went to town and came back with chocolate, nurses and people would be applauding me for walking 100 yards. That to me <laughs> is where all the astrology is leading me. All the hot Swiss nurses. Applauding you. It, absolutely. For walking. I told my sons, I say, on no circumstances can you send me a German, too short hair German nurse. That is not okay. <laughs> and I'll be very disappointed if they don't do that. Just, yeah, yeah, that's right. Try yeah. to keep flirting even when you're dying. Damn right. Yeah. <laughs> Go out flirting. Do you have a problem? Do you have a problem? Go out flirting. <laughs> Come on. It's all about the eroticism. <laughs> they keep it erotic right to, the, you know, my mother at 85, we were watching a football game. She was giving the finger to the opposing team the whole time. And I, she turned to me in an a commercial and said, Stephen, can I tell you something? I said, what? I just love sex. I miss it. And I said, you know, Ma, I love that you say that. That is the greatest thing. God love you for, I love men. That's what she said. She had Aww. buried three husbands. <laughs> and all of them, no, she buried them. They had no chance. They had no chance. But she buried three of them. And they were all good men. Because, and she, her father was a great man. So her view of men were, they're okay. <laughs> they're not, they're not the pigs that we know we are. <laughs> she thought they were great. Anyway, that's the end of my story. <laughs> I love it. Well, I want to go ahead and give you a wee bit of an introduction today. Right. Yeah. And then you can fill in whatever blanks, but I'm going to gush for a little bit because I know Stephen Campman because a couple years ago, I guess it was actually 2019, a friend that was a part of this astrology apprenticeship that we did recommended that I listen to Synchronicity with Noah Lampert and he interviewed you about your dreams course. And I listened to it and I was like, I've got to do this. It was just an immediate, there's, there's something going on with Steven. I don't know who this guy was. I wasn't familiar with who you were. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I no, did know what WKRP no. Cincinnati was, no, no, but I, <laughs> no, 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 I think it's good. That's fine. Yeah. But anyhow, it's been profound. I just want to really let the audience know and our listeners know Stephen's really been an amazing mentor to me the last several years. And um, it's just really helped me deepen my own process and get to know myself in a way that I never really knew was possible. Um, he, his dreams course is amazing. So I want to create somewhat of an opportunity to, for you to elaborate on your dreams course, but we talk a lot about, um, Carl Jung on our podcast. We use a lot of terminology and astrology that comes from Carl Jung, everything from the anima to animus to self-actualization. Um, so that'll become a part of it. But yeah, welcome. Thank you for coming. It's just been a long time in the making. And I'm so excited that you can yeah. be with two of my favorite ladies as well. I love it. I love being here. And I, and I think one of the things that Kestrel really was my first kind of dreamer in a way that, that had um, that maybe the first period and if not had substance and weight and I think she taught me that really mentoring work of any sort, it's really synergy. If it works and you're the mentor, you're actually, your energy is higher at the end of the hour than it was. It's not a one way street where you're, you know, which is the, you know, the battery vampires who live out there that suck the very blood out of you. Those, those folks, it's like the synergy comes together and I've looked for that in any dreamer I take as the connection that if that's happening, it's good things are happening in the teaching. 
if not only if they're up, but I'm up. So I always ask at the beginning, uh, how's your energy? And at the end, how's your energy? Because finally, it's all about energy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So I don't know what else to say other than this is the most interesting chapter of my life because I discovered four years ago I have Parkinson's. And that was kind of a shock, but not really, because you begin to examine and understand your life in a different way. And I'm doing radical things about it. I, I Skype with a mentor in Israel that's just a phenomenal man named Alex Curtin, who's written a book, uh, Goodbye Parkinson's Hello Life. And it's about the mental approach. So it's good for therapy. It's good probably for what you guys talk about. It's the mental. It's the perception of my condition that will determine how I will be. If I decide that I'm a Parkinson's patient, I will stoop over. I'll have not only the tremors, but I'll have a lot of other problems because now my brain is telling the story of Parkinson's as opposed to as a Parkinson's symptom, it doesn't define me. And I'm working with some of the most interesting people in Europe who are students of Alex and we're now putting together a people working, people with Parkinson's, helping people with Parkinson's. And the stories of hearing their stories of how they just looked at Parkinson's in the face and just said, screw you, you're not taking my life from me. And um, so that's been my work. And I think because of that work, the, the teaching I did at the Dreams Course, which I began 15 years ago when I was teaching in a boarding school, and now I've evolved it into a really a 10-week program and for adults and um, who are looking to, you know, be in touch with everything they can be in touch with in their inner life, being control, being the conductor of their own or orchestra, and knowing they can move from anything from erotic to very serious to focus to anything that you're conducting it. You're the conductor. You're not a victim. You're, you're putting power together and you know when to apply it if you're in connection to it. And uh, so teaching that course, everything that I teach, every money I never see, it goes directly to research or to a local here, uh, Parkinson's place in Maine. And that's giving me freedom. That's just giving me, I don't care. I'm here for, I know why I'm here. I've had an interesting career, a happy, interesting life. And now I'm serving a purpose that's the highest one I've felt in my life. And oddly enough, because I have Parkinson's, <laughs> which I don't want, by the way. But there it is. What else? Tell me now. Let's do a little astrology. Yes? Well I was going to ask you, Stephen, I, I'm curious how your dream life has shifted since you learned that you had Parkinson's. Wow. That's a good one. A lot of them are mundane. Except last night I was, um, it's mundane, but I did have a couple of spirit dreams that I've never had, including one of my writing partners who passed away two years ago, visiting me as someone who was on the other side. And that was interesting because I'm pretty much really at a point in my life where that's all I really want to know about. I want to help whatever, but I want to approach where I am in life in a really open way and find as many doors I can open to see what, what is this mystery that we're all in, where we're here, our bodies are gonna get older and decay and die, but what about our spirits? Where, where do, does that live on? And if so, how does that work? You know, all that stuff I think is so interesting. So the dreams have reflected a little bit of that, I think more. But I think because of the work I'm doing, my own dream life isn't particularly that interesting to me these days. A um, few images are interesting, but not generally. I'm curious to see how we can 
overlay the dream world with the astrology because I okay. feel this theme coming through for you of you know we incarnate into this world if you believe that I don't know um with right. you know a particular karma kind of particular awareness and a particular knowing that can really express itself through a chart and then the chart can also express kind of we call it the north node more of where where our soul's kind of destiny or desire drive is growing towards or moving towards. And I just find it interesting as you've been diagnosed with Parkinson, how it's almost like you're getting a little bit of the communication from the other side. And, Mm. you know, the, the chart is a representation in a way of how we incarnate into this life and how we can self-actualize in this lifetime. Wow. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> no complaints there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've always felt that um, I, I've had readings done. I did have a reading back in the seventies, but it wasn't like on the level that we're talking about, but there was interest there. But again, I come back to it. It, You know, if you believe in this spirit of connections, which I, I I believe I once had a dream where one fragment of myself and my whole self, my real self merged together in a dream and a kiss. And I woke up with explosive energy because I, I connected two parts of myself together into the broken fragments of uh, it's like the self comes in and suddenly is coming out of, of a vagina saying uh why uh, who did this who can i <laughs> i want to have the answers right get put those lights down what are these things arms and then we forget ourselves forever <laughs> and ever until we're by age because it's so traumatic to be actually informed Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, I when you talk about the the planets and stuff, what I get from that is the connection of planets to one another are the similar thing. They're they're putting fragments of things connected relationships with one another. Right. Mm -hmm. So give me. how can we how can we, how can you explain that to me so that I can understand it a little bit more? I'm really curious if you can go into some detail about how you teach and what is involved in the dream course because I feel like that could be a foundational point in how we dovetail into some of the astrology. <clears throat> okay. It's a good point. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest thing that happens is I do it by phone and not doing what we're doing now. Mm because I want only voice to be heard because it's easier to be more open than it is when we're doing one another because we're assessing one another and looking, you know, we're we're, visually, we're taking everything in. So everything is done by phone. And what I noticed early was I finally spoke really authentically and said things that took a risk to people. But what I really felt, I, I didn't try to play them or, put them through an experience, but basically no change. I kind of, I kind of just said, this is what I'm getting. This is what I feel from, you know, that kind of thing. And so my teaching tries to be two things. One out of all, I do an interview to start it with where that teaches me a lot about the person doing it and they get a chance to hear me respond and, and how I, and then I interpret a dream at the end of that interview. And based on that interview and the dream, I then give them 24 hours to think about it. Because if you're gonna come and take the course with me, I want a commitment. I'm putting myself there and I'm gonna give you everything I've got and I want it back. And if you're not serious about it, or you're playing games with joining, you know, you're a junkie for these kind of things, but you actually have resistance to change. If I smell that, I told very clear, I'll say, if I get that from you or you don't check in with me, uh, we're done. 
I, not personal. I'm not angry. I just, I want to, it's so exciting to be around people that are trying to grow. Uh, you know, I mean, I was once in a relationship that I thought the love would never end. But as it worked out, one of us was growing and one of us wasn't. And that is really hard to take. So I want the same from the people that come and I, I'm there. When I'm there, I'm there. So I don't know if that answers it, but it's how I feel about it. When it's good, that's how it comes. That's how I, I express it. I'm curious because you've described it as a course and then you also have described yourself as a mentor. But it, well, from what I'm hearing, you're also expecting your mentees or the participants to be as involved and as engaged in their own self-development. So it starts to sound a bit like therapy. And I'm curious, like, is it merging all of those categories or um, yeah. how, do you, how do you put words to those distinctions if they are there? I think there are not many distinctions. I think the one thing I'm reluctant to talk about but I'm feeling more and more is basically the course, if you really, if it's successful and you become individuated, you're following your own path. But I believe that path is a connection to your spiritual self. I mean, I mean, I believe in that. I believe in spiritual being. I'm a spiritual being. And therefore, it's not just psychology. It's not just dream stuff. Remember, one of the things that dreams do that is fantastic is they're putting on a a show, a movie for you every night, actually four or five, because they come in cycles. And they're making movies where you're the director, star, and writer, and producer, and everything. And there's no question by following my dreams for this many years that I'm much more of a creative person than I started out to be. I would have never been writing or doing any of that stuff without my dream life. It's like a source of, it's like a, it's like a, a well that I can come to and every day sending me images. So let's just start on that, just what they're doing that. Dreams are also healers. They indicate parts of our bodies that are, they're talking to us from the unconscious and they only have, they don't have, they're not verbal like our, like the new, the new brand, new cortex, neocortex. There, it's coming from an unconscious with images and then we have to interpret that. That's why just two students I took on are artists. And I, I don't, I said to them, I don't, <laughs> I don't, it's one of those moments. I don't want to talk the dreams with you. I want you to draw them. Like Carl Jung did in the Red Book. Draw them. If I could draw, that's all I would do. Because it's coming from truth. And the images are so wild. I mean, I had dinner last night with my mother and two of my brothers in a train station, just with trains coming by. It was just such a weird place to be. And forget whether what, what it means, I just, the imagery I just loved, the imagery of a, dream, of a train and having lunch as trains are coming by on different directions. So creativity, healing, balance. When you're out of balance, then your dream life tries to put you back into balance. So one of the things that is the most significant part of the course after we start getting into it is to begin giving names to the different inner voices you have. So, you know, mine are like uh, Andy, Angry Al, Angry, Anxious Andy, uh, Competitive Chaz, Insecure Andy, uh, Jealous Jimmy, you know, it goes down the list. Randy Resistant, Wally Weary Work, Stevie Sexy Boy, Steven Spiritual Boy, Stressed Out Steve, Too Sensitive Steve, uh, Judd the Jugger, Izzy the Impatient, Fearful Freddy, Funny Frankie. They're in my head all the time. <laughs> and now that I've given them names and my students have given their name, we can, we can address them when they show up. So when Lazy Larry, who's really big in me, shows up to me when I'm walking my dog or going up a hill and Lazy Larry points out to me, Stephen, why don't we just go back to the house, get some ice cream and sit on the sofa and watch a game? <laughs> Much better plan than what you're doing. And I said to Lazy Larry, Larry, I hear you. 
but just for your attitude, not only are we going up the hill, we're going to run the hill. And the time I got to the top of the hill, Lazy Larry was friggin' gone. So I try to have my dreamers identify what are the loudest voices in their mind? Are they controlling them? Where are they from? And then to talk about the alchemy of being able to, in an instant, change that chemistry so that you're completely having a different perception with the idea that we don't have to hold on to these things we've dragged in from our childhood that still we react to. We can change them. We're adults. We can go, no, lazy Larry, no, or yes to a part of you that needs it. Part of you that each of us isn't nourished. Some part, everybody is not nourished. Well, your job is to nourish it, damn it. Not to ignore it. Go to the garden, give it water, give it plants, feed it, let it grow, let it be strong in you. That's your orchestra. Why do you want a weak part? And why do you want the tuba playing so loud? It's an obnoxious voice in you. So tell it to shut up. Anyway, that's the course. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, boy. So the actual last thing of the course to do is the coolest thing is if someone gets to the end of the course and they want to take a risk in their life toward their individuated path, that's the final exam. That's when you take a risk where you're following your inner self. We also, by the way, read Damien by Herman Hess because he did 62 sessions with Joseph Lang, a disciple of Young. And Hess, when he came out of it, suddenly understood for the first time why, how his feelings, why his feelings existed, the structure of individuation, anima, shadow. And he wanted to write a book of individuation. He wanted to write a book with a plot that leads nowhere but to the self. God, I love that. A plot that leads nowhere but to the self. And so he did. So we also, in three sessions, discuss that book, treating the whole novel like it's a dream. It's a dream, so you can identify who's the shadow, who's the animus, who's the animus, where is individuation, when is he following his inner self? Following your inner self. It takes, you have to be brave to do that. And I love you know, how the mentors easy. show up too in Herman yeah. Hesse's book, Damien. You know, I hadn't actually yeah. read that book until I worked with you. And I just, it was just such an amazing representation of the process of self-actualization. And I think you and I yeah. discovered and, too, the bird, yeah. the Abraxas. Um, I was so intrigued by that because I think, I don't know if either one of you know this, but I did a little bit of research. The Abraxas is also representative of the main seven, you know, luminaries and planets, the original, the sun, the moon, Mercury out to Saturn. So I thought that was an interesting overlay, especially pulling in how much Carl Jung also emphasized astrology in his life and how he that archetypal landscape not only in the dreams but also using the astrological chart trying to kind of merge these together a little bit is oftentimes he could see certain archetypes or certain hidden parts of the patients he was working with but he couldn't pinpoint it so then he started casting charts and placing the planets and looking at the houses wow. and looking at um the different signs that the planets were placed in, because we know, at least in the structure of astrology, there's 12 houses and the first house represents the self I am. And so that's so key in the self-actualization process. The rising sign for each individual is kind of what's helping that person navigate into you know, what the individuated path could potentially be. And then each of the 11 other houses represent a part of the life. And so when he would cast these charts, it would allow him to more critically or in a hidden way, see what he wasn't able to name in sessions and then go deeper archetypally and oh. see a certain complex playing out, for example, like, 
a mother complex or a lesser than complex, or maybe even something in the body pointing to where the moon is in the chart. And that was like another overlay I wanted to play in with you a little bit, because, you know, you've got such an access to this language already, but when we bring in the moon, and I think I recently told you about a dream I was having, I had this womb dream of birthing my womb. Um, but it was also like represented in my body. And when I went and looked back at the moon and where it was, it, w- it was going through my sixth house, which would represent my health. And it was like, okay, maybe something beautiful and creative is being born out of this dream. But on the other hand, maybe I should get, maybe I should get a checkup. <laughs> um, so I yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> What did you do? Did you get a checkup? Yeah, yeah. Everything okay. is fine. <laughs> okay. It's just funny that I'm not... I wonder if there's a specific Jungian book, because I have a lot of his his books were Bulletin Press out of Princeton. Yeah. Um, Jungian Astrology is one of his books. Wow. Oh, well, or it's not his book, okay. but it was written by... Um, Saffron Rossi and Karen Legrice. Did I pronounce that right? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's evidence of some of the work that he was doing with astrology. But I think it's beautiful that you made it to Bollingen Place. And um, I know that a lot of well, just astrological representations show up in the artwork around there but it's it's still a mystery it's still coming out this is fairly recent that a lot of his unpublished works coming up speaking more about the research he was doing okay perfect yeah I think too that there's something to be said for um astrology being woven into one's practice and and not necessarily baked into their theoretical production so if he was writing books that weren't nec- that were maybe exploring other topics, but I think it's still possible that astrology was was feeding the undercurrents of, of his thought at, at least at certain times of his life. I don't know about the entire trajectory, but I find that as an astrologer in the consultation room and also as a writer, I, I, I write astrology for a living. Um, I'm always drawing on archetypes and that's a Jungian concept. And it's also a concept of course, that we see in dream Um, or maybe we don't have to. And maybe that's a question for you, Stephen. Like, do you, do you work with archetypes when you analyze dreams or do you use? Yeah, I do. No, I, dreams are so multifaceted because on the one simple level, they're, they turn short-term into long-term memory when we're asleep. They also are kind of like a cleaning house of the brain, like like a, a maintenance person late at night doing the waste baskets. It, it literally is preparing the brain for the next day. It has to do with healing. It has to, it's so many, but and therefore I could lose my dreamers if I did. So I simplified it down to the basic Jungian terms, which are included uh the basic archetypes the collective unconscious anima animus shadow self and individuation and the first thing i do when i send out to my students is to send them a pamphlet that i put together over the years i've been teaching this which is like 30 pages of just a really rough dream history i mean you can read it in 10 minutes but it connects you to you know what is ram how long have we been, you know, like Freud, the significance of Freud is up to that point, dreams were only for prophecy and only for princes and kings. And he democratized dreams, which has changed everything completely. So forget whether you agree, whether sexual repression and wish fulfillment, which I rejected. My brother was a big, uh, he introduced me, both these men, but I went the way of Jung and he went the way of Freud. And I just, I, I saw Young just so much more open to more. He just was open. He was just trying to open up doors, including uh, the spiritual self and the astrological self. And, uh, and he believed, you know, he believed in an afterlife and Freud was an atheist. 
So for me, I don't want to learn anything that doesn't have a spiritual acceptance of some sort. I don't have to know what it is because I don't, but I believe in it. It's too much of a miracle that we're living for it not to be something, something. So um, we go through the anim and very interesting for the female people I have, and of course there are more women who sign up for my course because men are so much more uptight to explore their inner self than women are. Women are just more, my experience in both teaching teenagers and adults, they're just, they're just, men are more shut down. They have it, but they're just, they're, 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 they're lost in their own stereotypes. But women who are successful, I have a couple of students that are getting PhDs at 24 years old, but their animus, their male self has been so bludgeoned over eons that while everything else is good, that part of them, which is like the conductor in their inner voice, the, the conductor the runs it, hasn't, has taken a beating and it isn't as high as it should be. It's one of the real common things I see across the board, nothing to do with their outer life. It, I completely believes it's it's the passing on from generation of the repression of the female spirit. And for them, it's like, you don't need an animus. Yeah, you do. You need an animus to stand up for your authentic self, to protect you, the protection that you didn't get in a relationship or from a parent that makes you dependent on someone outside of yourself to be that for you when you can be that yourself, knowing that something is inside you that is looking after you. That's, to me, worthy of growth. So a lot of the work and then go to the self, which to me is the unified, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the unity, it's the wholeness, the duality ends with it. It's, to me, it's in dreams, they're circular, or often the number four is significant. And individuation is just simply a person's unique path to their self. What is your path? That's what makes it so interesting to meet other individuated people because what you're doing, what Eliza is doing is different from Jasmine, from Kestrel to me. We all have stories, but we're all moving, trying to listen to that inner voice and not be ruled by the powers and the pressure of society. I'm, I'm curious how how you work with dreams to find the individuated self, especially, I know that's, I'm sure, a long process, but what I'm thinking of is, it's been my experience recently anyway, that, that my dream world really does feel like a, a hygiene system where I keep working in my dreams. It's so aggravating. I will spend all day working and I will continue interpreting charts, <laughs> astrology charts in my dream more often than not. <laughs> and I don't think that's my, my individuated self. <laughs> so I'm curious, like, how do you, how do you locate that inner being or that spiritual self, especially if your dreams seem to be just doing some of the heavy lifting of sifting through your day. And where's the off button? Well, that's the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's a good one. Uh, I always think the most interesting dreams are the, re are the dreams, the reoccurring dreams, you know, that kind of the same theme is coming up because for me, that just means you're not getting the message. So it says, I'm sending this to you again. So the astrology, and that if you and I were having that conversation, I'd begin with, let's just talk about the balance in your life right now. How many hours are you putting into work? What is your personal life? What have you developed internally that where you are giving your time over to your growth as opposed to your business and what you do and all that? What kind of balance are you in? Because if the dream is sending you other work dreams, it's laughing at you. You didn't know you were going to put Damn. the spot, Eliza. <laughs> Dreams have a great sense of humor. <laughs> they have a great sense of humor. So it's kind of saying, I guess this is what you really want, so I'll just keep it up. Or as opposed to if you made one effort, and in the course we would do that. That's what we're doing. We're going, where are you? What are you now out of balance? What aren't you nourishing in yourself right now? And then I fully expect it. I guess we know what a pain in the ass I can be. 
I fully expect to start doing it that day. Like, what are we waiting for? What are you waiting for? Next week, when it's a better week, less charts to do. Now. <laughs> That's where the fun is. Come on. Uh-oh. I know I want to give her a but, chance uh, to respond, but it's kind of uncanny because I'll even share, you know, I had so much insecurity coming into the course. I think a big part of, of why I was attracted to the work is my animus was running amok or it was so puny woony that I was getting my animus all over every, I was basically projecting it onto other people sort of to be rescued in some way. And so <laughs> when we started, I think one of the very first dreams I shared with you, I remember that it was myself as a tiny baby in the water with another tiny baby. We were, we were swimming and there was just this sense of oneness and I can't remember it accurately, but I remember one of the things that you reflected about my dream world was just how connected I was to the collective unconscious already. And that in itself just made me realize that my inner world was a lot more integrated and whole than how mm -hmm. I felt mm -hmm. on the outside world. And so it was almost like right. the opposite. I was needing to work from the inside of what my inner world was really marrying back to me that I was a lot more yeah. self-actualized and, and whole, like I was really truly whole and worthy already, but I couldn't, the, the outside world was, I guess, was failing me to see it. I think you have a great quote about that too. Something about when the outside world starts to fail you, we go on this inward journey. And so uh, the dream yeah. course is a part of that, but also the astrology has been a big hint of just really reinforcing and validating where I am on the path. It's almost a mirror of, of how I'm evolving in this lifetime. And I think each person's chart, no matter how difficult it is, it is really showing us how we're growing or maybe little hints or crumbs along the way of what sort of work we could do or what area of the chart we could pay attention to, or what part of this inner dream work, you know, for me particular was developing more <clears throat> bringing my animus more into union union with my anima where with like Eliza, it could be potentially something else that she's getting hints about. I love that. Um, I, I mean, first of all, yeah, you're so, you're so deeply, your inner stuff is very strong and your outer stuff was more difficult. So as you remember, there was a decision about you were going through about your mother's apartment or something. Mm. And you were struggling making a decision. <laughs> Mom, if you're listening, and, <laughs> she probably will listen. Okay. No, go for and, it, and Stephen. Anyway, I won't go for it. I, I don't remember all the details, but I know that it was basically, if your animus is at full speed, it's saying, I'm not on the planet forever. I'm getting things done now. And let the universe work for you. And you did that, whatever the situation was, you cleared it up. And I, and I always thought that you have so much going on inside you that developing, that it's your, you do, unlike most people, you need to strengthen your animus outside personality because to balance with your strong anima that you, I mean, you're, you're, you are an anima, you are a capital A anima. <laughs> and your outside self is shyer, not as not as confident. And usually it's the opposite way around. That's what's so interesting about you. So when you start making decisions in the present, in the conscious world, that's beginning to feed your own inner animus. Or what I give to the streamers, I give them to pick out three quotes from famous feminist quotes of strength and then they memorize them and they say them every day as a reminder it's like taking your animus to the gym there are quotes about saying no one's going to tell you what you know basically no one tells you what to do follow yourself kind of things and you if you say it every day eventually which is what i do i say 100 quotes a day to combat the negativity of the brain which is essentially is negative it's you know it's looking out for who's behind us, who could kill us, where, you know, it's negative based. So I try to feed positive stuff into it. 
but you have all that going at uh, Kessel. But I'd be interested to know where you, where where you guys are, or Lisa, or Lisa. Where are you at in terms of? Is your animus strong? Is your animus anima? You know, where where are you in balance of everything? Well, I'm I'm just listening to you, and I'm trying to understand if I'm if I'm understanding you correctly, and that there is a distinction between your your outer animus being strong versus your inner animus being strong. Because I right. I have felt and have been told <laughs> uh, both that I I actually struggle to be a bit more I, I struggle to to involve my anima more I. Um, in that I feel much safer and much um, more at ease when I'm totally independent, totally doing my own thing, not in a relationship, not just, just in my own kind of silo, plugging away at my own vision. <laughs> and, and I can be yeah, I very, I would say that my willfulness, which I do associate with the animus, is probably my one of my more defining qualities um, so I, I have felt that my animus is stronger. However, I do see kind of these shadowy ways in which it's not so strong. And actually, I think I can imagine my anima being weaker, not just because I'm not expressing that archetype as, um, or I'm not connecting to that archetype as readily, but also because I'm expressing maybe even the shadow sides of that archetype, where sometimes I can be perhaps... Yeah. Um, passive or fearful about what other people think, which isn't necessarily a strong animal oh, archetype. I, I have the same thing. And it's one of my voices. Mm. It's one of the voices I point out. It's a horrible voice. It's a voice that is judge, judgmental. It's a voice that is fearful, negative. It just doesn't bring anything to the dance. But um, going back to the teaching, what you just said, the students try to learn the anima and the animus and the anima, the animus for you would be any male figure that would show up in a dream. So depending on the strength of that animus, if it's consistent over a few dreams, you'll get a sense of how strong your inner animus is. If it's weak, and then also that often ties in obviously, I mean, I'm, the older I get, the more I realize how powerful from a habit point of view our childhoods are. Because whatever trauma, or even if it's not big, is experienced, is experiencing really intensely because we have no common experience to fall back on. And so to break those are really, really hard. And so in your dream, we would see the animus. We also would see that would be a male and your anima would be represented by, and shadow could be represented by the, another female figure. So if it was the shadow, it would show it, show it up. I had a student, by the way, very interesting, currently going on, who told me, how do you get rid of jealousy? And the question was, there was someone at work who was the opposite of everything she wanted to be, but she was getting further ahead than she, <laughs> she was. She was lazier, she left early, my dreamer was dutiful, did harder work, and she was enraged. And what she was really enraged about, it was tapping into everything, her own shadow, the parts of herself that she didn't like. And the closer she's getting to this person, the closer she's getting to allowing that shadow to express itself, which would be a disaster at work, you know, suddenly coming out. That's what happens when the shadow gets uncaged. And I finally said to her, just be authentic. Call her and say, let's just talk, meet. Tell her you're feeling this way. That you think she has these qualities and, and don't, you don't want to feel that way anymore and want to get to know you because I'm projecting all this onto you. And see what she said. You, have, you could end up being great friends. But the path you're going where you ignore it is asking for trouble. So you want to look at your female, the shadow figure in you if it shows up. But even on the anima for you, capital A, your female figures, what are they like? Are they vulnerable? Are they powerful? Are they, uh, do, can they surrender? Isn't that the big thing? Can you surrender? Can any of us surrender? 
really give in because that's what I think we want. I want to, I want to surrender. When you fall in love, it's surrendering. It's the greatest feeling on the planet. So we begin, I say this and I, as the way to understand your dreams, it's images. So all I ask you when you wake up, how do you feel about the dream? I'm scared, I'm nervous, I'm confused, I'm whatever. Then you ask yourself, where in my life am I having similar feelings? If you identify it, then you then say, what do I need to do to rectify that feeling so I can give it balance to the rest of my psyche? What do I, do I need to reach out? Do I need to do something physical? You know, what do I need to do? And then you go do it. So you're directly responding to the dream, emotional part of the dream by acting and validating it into the conscious experience. It's very important that we take our inner lives and put them on the line in the conscious world. That's how validation and union happens. It doesn't happen by your awareness. That's good, but it's still chicken bones. It's still, what does chicken bones mean? I just, what the hell, <laughs> how do I say chicken bones? I just made up as an expression, chicken bones. I would absolutely put I, was too. <laughs> I love my wife. I'm going to ask my wife to put me in an institute as soon as we get off this call. In Switzerland. In Switzerland. In Switzerland. <laughs> and where the nurses, With the pretty nurses. nurses <laughs> are clapping because I walked a hundred yards to get chocolate in the town. And they're going, oh, you're walking. You're so beautiful, Stephen. No, you should say Mr. Campman. I'll say Stephen. <laughs> this is the dream, ladies. Get your own, but that's mine. Yeah. <laughs> but I hear you, you know, the chicken bones. It's like, no, how do we make this tangible? You know, <laughs> please for everyone for a day, use chicken bones. I want to see if I can make that go. <laughs> just use an expression. Just say, oh, it's so chicken bones this morning. I faced my neighbor and instead of saying something, I, I chicken boned out of it. <laughs> we're gonna, that's what we're going to title the podcast. Chicken bones it's with chicken Stephen bones. Campman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chicken bones himself. With chicken bones himself, Stephen Campman. Um well, do you want to do what 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 else is interesting or going on? I didn't get to you, Jasmine. Could you tell me a little about your own dream world a little bit. Sure. Um I was actually thinking about the astrological overlay of how I interpret my dreams and how to work with them and what I do. Um, and I also have a, a question for Kestrel about how taking this course with Stephen, how has it changed your interpretation of the chart and how you use that for growth and um bettering yourself with your dreams and, and how do you, how does it become practical and tangible for you? But um, back to me, I mean, when I dream the first thing and I remember my dream and I wake up, the first thing that I do is I look at where the moon is transiting in the sky and how it relates back to my own natal chart. And that will give me some context in how to work with the dream and I would say nine times out of 10, it's spot on for what the dream is representing. Um, wow. And most of the time, the transiting moon is touching one of my natal planets. And so I'll, I'll know after I have that dream that, oh, I need to work with the archetype of Saturn. But that's definitely oh. something that the audience could take away from this podcast and how to work with dreams and working with their charts and see if it, it helps. I would love to have, I, I, I wish I had that because I've got the other thing going, but don't have the astrology, but to add that to the possibility of conversations, because ultimately what I really want to do is be in Paris at a cafe having discussions for six hours where no tangents because all tangents always come back. So we trust it. And I couldn't 
make reference to astrological charts and dreams. I could go leave my dream world and into that world as you could leave your astrological world and come into the work I'm doing and you'd have stronger, you'd have, you'd have varied views. And then, like you said, if they married, that's pretty good confirmation. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, but how long, I mean, how long is it taking you to get to the, each of you to get to the point where you are with your knowledge of astrology? How long, where you are now, how many years have you, you think it's taken? For me, I would say three or four years. That's and not too bad. Well, and as far as working with dreams, I've been using astrology to interpret my dreams for probably a solid two. Um, but I mean, there's just, there's so much room for growth and, <laughs> and knowledge in that. Uh, I feel like I'm just tipping the iceberg in that department. Wow. That's interesting though, that you approach your understanding of a dream that way. It's very, some way it's very integrated. Yeah, I mean, the the archetypes, yeah, the archetypes are there. And if you are able to interpret how they fall in your chart, and, you know, most people that listen to our podcast are familiar with their natal natal charts. So what does that mean? Is that your birth? Mm -hmm. That's your birth. Yeah, your birth chart. Your birth chart. So the chart of the moment you were born. I think you did mine, Kestrel, of something that I had a lot of Gemini's in. You have a lot of Gemini's. Yeah, is okay, it okay if we tell the audience? All right, yeah. ladies. All right, lady. Uh-oh. You're good. I'm open. I, I can take it. So what is that? Tell me what that implies in your world if you were... If I were doing a session with you, what, what kind of conversation would, you, would we be having? Well, I'll, I'll link it back to an archetype. When I look at your chart and see them in Gemini, the first archetype that comes to mind is that of the trickster. And I wonder if you have a bit uh-huh. of a trickster spirit. Well, one of my, one of my voices is Joey Jokester. <laughs> uh, Joey Jokester is Gemini, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay okay well, all right so that makes sense he, yeah he's in there i mean I don't, I don't do bad pranks but i do like to do i like to laugh let's put it that way all right so well and then yeah, i was saying else? to you so you're you know you're a gemini rising and you have a gemini sun so that part's really lit up it also speaks to the comedy i think you really shine in that way and then your moon is in scorpio in what we call the sixth house and that could um you know represent health it also could represent what you do in your routine in your day to day and i you know find it striking because I think that your Scorpio moon really lends itself to that deeper inner exploration. Um, you know, Scorpio is very penetrator. It really wants to get under the surface of things and deeper into the unconscious. I mean, a Pisces moon like I have is very much that way too. It can be um, very connected to the collective unconscious as well and a desire to connect. And so, you know, all this work that you've done given me to do especially around the anima and animus has really helped me you know bring the anima and animus into union in myself in relation to myself but also in relationship to others to really um, facilitate more healthy dynamics and relationships in general in the waking life Um, but you have such a heavy emphasis in gemini it would be really interesting to watch the moon in your particular tar- chart as it went through Gemini and how many downloads you got about yourself. I mean, it does seem like somewhat of a self-actualization and awakening energy. Um, you also have Uranus. And if your first- I were okay. saying to you, go ahead. what would be the balance? What's the balance of that? I'm sorry. What's the balance of that? So 
like if I were to develop another quality so the, the Gemini qualities aren't dominating to that extent, because in the dream world, I'm always looking for your balance. Where are you out of balance? Where are you not nourishing yourself? And in the same way, it would seem to me that like in this case, there's probably from an astrological point of view, I need some sort of a balance of some sort, which I don't think I've really had a lot in my life. I think I, I connected to basically anxiety and tension is as much the culprit of Parkinson's as any other way I could have gotten it. It's mm -hmm. if you have too much anxiety or as my mentor says, the body lives in the present and the mind lives in the past and the future. So when the past and the future mind goes crazy, the body's experiencing it like survival syndrome. It doesn't know. And if you lived a life of that, that's a lot of, that's a lot of work you're putting on your immunity system, mm -hmm. bottom line, right? So I wonder what would be the balancing part that I might emphasize more in my life given what you just described? I think if I can uh, offer something there, I, you can think about that in two ways. You can think about that in terms of the axis. So every sign has its polarity. Every sign has its opposite. So the opposite of Gemini, which provides a literal balance, you can see yeah. them as two sides of a teeter-totter. The opposite of Gemini is Sagittarius. And what, that's an interesting polarity because they're almost... I would say of all of the 12 signs or the six polarities, Gemini and Sag, I think have more in common than some of the other polarities. But the distinction is Gemini is focusing on um, the, the micro or the, the, the granular view, the details, the facts, the, the sifting through information. Whereas the Sagittarius uh, counterpart to that is a little more expansive. I think it's, I think Sagittarius is less anxious. Gemini is known, I think, to have a lot of um, anxiety. I think Sagittarius is less anxious because it trusts more. It's ruled by Jupiter and Jupiter is a planet that has to do with faith, that has to do with trust, with just kind of knowing that everything will work out and just letting, really relaxing into the freedom of that. So that's one way wow. to answer your question, but I think the other one is looking at the elements. So Gemini is an air sign. It's, it's floating up here. That's where you get that kind of frenetic energy. Um, a, a way to ground that is to bring in a bit more of the earth element or to tap into the earth element, to tap into literally, maybe even physically gardening or working with the earth, standing on the grass with your bare feet. Things Definitely, like I, I relate to that. It bothers me sometimes that I I can't relax because I have a mind that's moving, you know, I'm thinking about my course, I'm thinking about, especially at this time, you know, like I want to do as much as I can in my life where I have the time. But I I miss the feeling where I can give surrender to relaxing, where I can appreciate that. I see it, but I don't appreciate it enough because I'm I've got too much of that other energy blocking it, you know, too much about ambition and things that I really should be done with. Uh, and my ambition is not a bad one. It's just, it's, it's trying to keep my course a lot. But, um, you know, I, I've been ambitious. That's how it works, you know. So I love the idea of finding ways that could allow me to surrender to relaxation, it would just be so great. <laughs> I live in such a beautiful place. Are you in when I look at it, I'm in the coast of Maine. Okay. Right on the coast, down on the coast. And um, it's a real sanctuary. And I, I, there's, um, it's just, Herman Hesse at the end of his life put a sign outside his, his house that said basically, I've been in the world, I've done it. I want to attend to my roses and drink wine. Please leave me alone. I'm kind of entering into that phase. Like, I really can't stand boring conversations, like to the point it drives me out of my mind. I don't understand how you can be on the planet and say, really, how are you doing? Oh, it's all going so good. Great. 
have the kids, couldn't be better. I'm having a nervous breakdown, but I'm not gonna show you. Um, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I just love these conversations. And in my course, I just, I, I always say to my students, I say, I am the teacher of this course, but I'm also one of its students. And that's how I feel. I'm sure you feel the same about the work you do. But, um, well, the opposite. So those qualities that I would work on to counter a little bit of the Gemini, to get a little bit more of the Sagittarius would be, let's say, give me three or four qualities and then I can figure out how to translate that into my inner psyche. How would that work? One of them's optimism. I would say Sagittarius is very optimistic, mm. which relates to ideas mm. around trust and faith. Um, what do you two think? I, I, I have a son in Sagittarius, so I could keep going, but <laughs> I want to. Wow, that's a big one. I, I like that. Yeah, a I sense like of adventure. That. It's yeah. kind of the letting go a little bit too. I mean, I think yeah. Scorpio has a big sense of letting go as well, but yeah, it's, it's allowing yourself to maybe trust that exploration mode. I mean, I know there's the ideas piece that can be really frenetic, but maybe rather than having to capture all those ideas, trusting that they're doing the work for you in more of an exploration wow. seeking mode. So that's surrender. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I, you know, when you said it too, I don't know how you guys are all feeling right now. I'm dying for an adventure. I'm dying to do something I haven't done and physically feel it. Mm -hmm. Feel my, you know, strength that I still can compete for myself, that I can do something. And I haven't found it yet, but I know it, I, I was longing for it. I think the COVID and, uh, Parkinson's and everything, but now I'm at a point where, yeah, an adventure, something really, something that lights it up. Don't get into the rut. Don't buy, buy into it. Because a lot of the adventures I'm having right now are mental. You know, the course and the Parkinson's people I'm working with. And, and so it's all that is up in here. Like when I get a massage, I need about two and a half hours of someone pounding on the top of my skull. <laughs> you know, yeah, your hands are good. Now move them higher. There. Now get it. <laughs> you know. Uh, all right, so adventure, a little bit more trust and surrender, a little bit more trust. Trust. How do you guys, what Young said that the only relationship you ever had to figure out in life was your relationship to the universe. I am dying for a great relationship with the universe. I have one. I, I, I definitely have one, but I feel I want to absorb more. How are each of you about your relationships to the universe? What is your relationship to the universe? <laughs> look at, each of you look so wicked right now. <laughs> I swear to God, all three, exactly the same look. Like, you think, you think we're going to tell you? <laughs> what's, your, what's your relationship with the universe? How's it going? Do you trust I, it? I do. And it feels somewhat animistic, too. And I'm constantly communicating with the sky and just in awe that we're even here in the first place. Wow. And love that. Yeah. So that's a little nutshell. How about you guys? That's big though. Mm. You know, um, Mary Oliver said that, you know, that she said the way the instructions for living, pay attention. Uh, what is the second one? Pay attention. Um, be, that's it. Be, be astounded. Pay attention, be astounded and tell the story. Be astounded. That's the feeling I, I think I'm missing. I would love to feel more of that. That's such a, that's a surrender feeling. That's good. Uh, ladies, 
I, I definitely what are you? with the with being astounded. Um, I mean, my relationship with the universe is always changing and evolving, but I definitely am connecting every day as best as I can. And mm. I think um, as of late, I've been really thinking of how I can be more of service and just less self-involved in order to stay connected and just focusing on that and um, really trying to do away with these ideas of, of separatism. And um, yeah, I mean, that's just how I, I'm trying to keep my perception <laughs> going. And uh, right. yeah, yeah. There's, it's an interesting thing because it came up at the end of my course. I teach the seven foods. This is Foods of the Spirit. My son, Mikey, and I do a podcast uh, called The Dreams Course. Mm -hmm. And it began with all the quotes I do. And then we reach it out of a bag, out of a hat, and then we discuss it. But we had the conversation on our own one day about, I said, look, who's feeding the spirit inside us? And we started to do a list. And I said, the first was breathe deeply and often, breathe well, breathe well. Find beauty every day, find something that you think is beautiful. Uh, think creatively in all choices, dwell in gratitude, serve the self and others, and inspire, be inspired, and laughter is an instant vacation. And the thing is so cool when you have those in mind so when I came up to the garbage cans that were all over the road by an older couple that would really have a pain, pain in the ass to pick it up, I didn't look at it like I would normally. I looked at it like, ah, oh, this is an opportunity for me to serve someone else. Mm -hmm. Now, no one's around, but I'm, I'm trying to look for it every day. I just found something at eight o'clock in the morning. I'm done for the day on that. And I may not be, but it suddenly changed. So when I was picking stuff up, I was thinking, I'm feeding my spirit. I'm feeding what it wants. It wants beauty. It wants power. It wants love, joy, connection. It wants all those, all those things. So when we get into a negative space to, to say, boom, I'm going to switch it around by doing something for others now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just change chemicals. I love and I love that. So I love when you're saying, you know, when I get too selfish or too self-involved or too, you know, having things to turn to that can break us out of that, so that we're serving the spirit as much as we humanly can. Because it's not easy to do to be in a body. Mm -hmm. it really isn't. It's all this crap is going on. Yeah. All the time, and and so it's hard not to identify it. How can you not identify with you? You know, what is it, uh, Sam? Whom I love, I love him. Sam, can't remember his last name. Does uh, does uh, meditation? He says meditation is the practice of not identifying with thought. Sam Harris. Like when you think, hey, there's he there. Yeah, I love like, Sam Harris. I boy. love him. I love Sam. I love Sam. Love Sam Harris. And he said not identify with thought. Well, if you're having a thought, of course you think it's you. You know, you think it's not, what is it? And he's trying to teach you, no, don't react to it. Yeah. Just let it come, right? And all that. Anyway. I've been using his app oh. for two years now, probably. And my daughter uses oh. his app, too. Mm -hmm. And she meditates every day. day with that app. And it's had just yeah. such a profound effect on on her life and her abilities. Mm-hmm. I listen to he's it great. every day. I like it. He's good. And he's the guy that got me onto the greatest spiritual book I've ever read because he had uh, a guest on and both of you know, they're heavy duty. You know, they're the night. Could be. If I went to an ashram for lunch and dinner, I'd be talking about it for a year. Yeah. They go to places for six months. Mm -hmm. And he said the greatest book teacher they've ever met is this guy, Sri Nazar Gadatta. 
and he wrote a book called I Am That. Mm. And I'm done reading spiritual books. It's, it's, I'm going to read it and underline in yellow, then go back and underline in blue. It's going to be just in waves I'm reading it because I don't understand everything. But I know he's he's on the game. He's he's worthy, like and that was Sam Harris. Mm-hmm. Anyway, do you want to tell us about your universe, Eliza, and then maybe we can see if there's anything else? And well, don't around. forget to tell the I... audience, Kestrel, about how you you use the the dream course and interpreting your dreams with astrology. I'm really curious about that from you. Yeah, that's really because she does do both. Yeah, she's she works. A, um, or how did it change think, after taking yeah. the course? Well, I think I just became more mindful. Like I have a practice of not only writing down my dreams, but also looking specifically at where the moon is and other significant transits. And the thing that I've just really noticed is when the moon's in a water sign for me personally. Um, It just seems like I'm dreaming more when the moon's in a water sign. And a lot of my dreams are cancer moon and it has a lot to do with the, well, with the collective. I mean, I think I have a lot that I'm still working out with groups. Um, How else has it changed? Do you mean the transiting moon being in cancer? That's when you're having those dreams. Yeah. Yeah. The transiting moon in cancer or in Scorpio or in Pisces in particular. Yeah. Well, and then it's also noticing what are the themes and the archetypes coming up as a result of my dream? And then looking to the chart and being like, oh my gosh, okay, no wonder I'm dealing with a relationship dream because the moon's passing through my relationship house or well, I'm having a do- deeply plutonic or transformational type of dream. Oh, the moon is crossing over Pluto. Just really simple, but starting to notice patterns. I'm not always consistent around it, but I think it is really Um, in addition to my dream work, I write down the dream, but I also, again, just to emphasize, look at where the moon is and other significant transits just to communicate the archetype. And don't you think timing, don't you think timing's important? I found that is looking at the chart immediately when you wake up is really important because you get that direct hit of what's happening in the transiting sky and how it is lining up with what's in your natal chart um Mm -hmm. because if i let time pass and it's not the same the interpretation isn't the same it has to be from the moment that i wake up and i'm still remembering my dream in the same way Mm -hmm. yeah and if i wake up in the middle of the night and remember the dream, I will sometimes pull the chart up as yeah. well, because it feels, it almost feels karmic. Like if, yeah. if something launches me out of the dream and I have enough awareness to remember, like sometimes I'll even audio record it and then I'll have the timestamp and then I'll go back and I'll pull the chart. And it just, it's uncanny, especially if Mercury's involved, <laughs> if Mercury's like touching something important or making an important aspect to something transient in the sky. It's almost like, no, you need it to hear this message loud and clear. Um, And it's even correlated with emails I've gotten too. It's not only, it's like the chart, the dream, and then it's like, okay, what is happening in my tangible world too? That's bringing in some crazy karmic, karmic message that I need to pay attention to. Does that ever paralyze your, does that, when you get a quantity of information, do you find that enhances decision making or paralyzes? Well, this one particular dream I'm re- referring to and getting launched out of sleep, it just felt really affirming and validating that I was getting mm-hmm. information on so many different levels. My dream right. was screaming it to me. The transit right. was screaming it to me. And then the email that came with a timestamp at that exact same time was screaming to me. And so what is, you know, that doesn't happen that often. That's That was really unique, but. Transit, when you say transit, you just mean the, the whole astrological universe? Transit, what does that mean? 
yeah how the planets are moving through the sky in real time okay yeah so like, for someone uh, someone like me and you were trying to introduce me to this world what would you have me read what what is the one that would give me a basis to at least kind of know what's going on anything is there a good book I mean, I don't think it's basic at all, but I love Cosmos and Psyche by Richard Tarnas. And that was the okay. book that I read in the in the beginning, even though I didn't understand a lot of it. <laughs> but it did spark my interest in a way to keep me on the path of studying. Um, and he didn't write that book for astrologers. He wrote that no. book for other academics. In the first, if you read it, the first 80 pages don't even mention astrology. It takes, mm -mm. It, he's really talking about world events and he's correlating it to major planetary transits or contacts with each other, planetary cycles. But it is really okay. fascinating um, from a historian's point of view, as mm -hmm. well as an astrologer's okay. point of view. Good. Anything else? Is that a good place to start? I think it is a good place to start actually. I think it, for somebody like you, yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> but I mean, Eliza. I don't know what that happen. laugh means, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm taking a trusting verb view of the universe. So I'm trusting it. <laughs> I think that's been the problem for me is that somewhere I learn I trust it, but I don't trust it mm -hmm. because of what happened to both my father and my brother. I just got. You know, the universe sometimes you get fear that it's going to just nab you, stab you in the back without you noticing. Things happen to me not when I'm on watch, but when I'm not on watch. They're just when I'm being open, I've had experience with things not being perfect. And I don't want to be in that mindset. I don't like that mindset. I like a trusting surrender view of the universe, giving into it much better, much healthier. Um, more relaxed, all of that. But I think it's been a struggle because of certain events that happened earlier in my life. Hmm. But everything I read is trust. I read trust. It's like I'm trying to reinforce, give over to it. That's such a better way than not giving over to it. Much happier to give over and surrender and say, you know what you're doing. I'm just, you know, I'm a leaf on a tree. Mm -hmm. I used to think I was the tree. And then I started to write a poem. And I realized, Christ, I'm not the tree. I'm one of the small leaf way on the top of the tree. You know? <laughs> you're already you're already starting <laughs> to implement the Sagittarius <laughs> part of your chart. Yeah. Just by saying Yeah, that. how about that? There you go. <laughs> how about that? Well, I love the optimism. That. I love to see, have you seen, by the way, this show, if you haven't seen it, it's my favorite new show called The Great on Hulu. No, but I will, I'll you know watch it. Oh my God, mm -hmm. oh my God. It's finally gonna be about the empowerment of a woman, Catherine the Great, but it's so bawdy, so entertaining, funny. It's got it all in one package, uh, highly entertaining recommend it to anyone anyway we'll put it in the show notes <laughs> <laughs> put it in the show notes i've had fun this is fun we like you too us. yeah <laughs> you guys are fun nice talking to you no yeah. yeah it's just uh I, I, you know it just feels nice to you know uh feel connected to people and know that they are studying things that are interesting and makes me want to know more. So that's been accomplished. I definitely want to, I want to go back. I'm going to take the Jungian boat book and the cosmos, mm -hmm. the cosmos and the psyche and you've given me homework. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got some homework to do too after this podcast. <laughs> um, that's We're nothing. That's nothing. <laughs> this is nothing. When it gets really wild is when, when you just start saying, you know, let's bring it on, you know.
I'm on the planet. And I keep pointing out, you know, we made it here. We were warriors to make it. We were, you don't get to come here if you're a weakling. It's not <laughs> like the weak got accepted. We beat out all the other eggs and sperms. Fuck them. We made it. <laughs> so let's say we came, you know, we came out of the gate, like a little bit of this. Let's have some attitude. <laughs> all right. Well, well, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of audience members that want to take your dream course. So where, where can they find you? And um, how, how does it all work? The works would be if you went to the the dreamscourse.org in small, no, no caps, the, the dreamscourse.org, that'll take you to my website. Mm -hmm. And on that website, there's also um, a place where you can press into the podcast I do with my son, Mikey, which is uh, a riot for me because we're rediscovering our relationship through these podcasts. And, um, I've really enjoyed them. So that's where they would find all the information they, they could, including how to reach me and ask about the course or how do you start it or what do you, you know, what do you do? My bio is in that website. So pretty much everything you would need to know on the, the dreamscourse.org and then they're in business. Did I say it enough? Let's do it one more time. The dreamscourse.org. There, four times. We'll great. write it in the show notes as well. <laughs> well, I've adored this and I love what you're doing and I hope we have a chance to speak again at some point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Kestrel, for making thank you, Kestrel, for making this happen. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. It's been an honor to have you here today. And I'm glad we were finally able to make it happen. Yeah. It's great to it's be with great. you. Thank you Excellent. so much, Stephen. All right. Goodbye, guys. Good night. Bye. 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 <laughs>